This episode of The Unstarving Musician is sponsored by Liner Notes. Learn from the hundreds of musicians and industry pros I've spoken with for The Unstarving Musician on topics such as marketing, songwriting, touring, sync licensing, and much more. Sign up for Liner Notes. Liner Notes is an email newsletter from yours truly in which I share some of the best knowledge gems garnered from the many conversations featured on The Unstarving Musician. You'll also be privy to the latest podcast episodes and Liner Notes subscriber exclusives. Sign up at unstarvingmusician.com. It's free and you can unsubscribe at any time. This is The Unstarving Musician. I'm Robonzo. This is my podcast. It features conversations with independent music artists and industry professionals with occasional special topic episodes featuring yours truly, a glimpse into the minds of my varied guests, all intended to help independent music artists better understand the marketing, business, and creative processes that empower us to do more of what we love, make music. Welcome to another episode. Thank you for joining me. It is always such a pleasure to be in your earbuds or on your speakers. How's things? Are you staying cool? Is it hot where you are? I hope not. We are having beautiful weather where I live. Don't hate me, but I hope you have beautiful weather too, or that you will soon. I would just send you mine if I could. I wouldn't trade you, necessarily. Depend what your weather's like. Uh, In my news, my world, (laughs) because I know you hang uh, on my every word and move as a musician. (laughs) My next video performance has turned into a setlist development thing, meaning I'm now rehearsing multiple tunes, which is good, but it's delaying my next video performance. So, yeah, I keep talking about it, but not recording it, but it'll happen soon, soon enough. And in other big news, my good friend, West Coast blues man Johnny Bergen is coming to Querétaro soon, and it looks like I'm going to have an opportunity to do some performances with him. I'm super stoked for that. Super stoked. Nice opportunity. And I just confirmed a show with the local blues ensemble, Uvia Azul, which will be October 13th at Moser Cafe Culture here in Querétaro. So if you find yourself here, come see me. See me, hear me. My guest for this episode is David Lane. David teaches piano, composition, and music theory. He's composed over 100 concert works, several films, and has been the arranger for several dozen works. He's scheduled to serve as vice president of the Winston-Salem Piano Teachers Association starting in the summer of this year, 2023, and currently is the chair of composition and theory for the North Carolina Music Theater Association. As an instructor, David specializes in teaching piano to adult beginners, teaching music theory to all ages and offering some conventional and non-conventional approaches to learning composition. He hosts two podcasts, one called The Musician Toolkit with David Lane, which is how I found him, and another called Life in the Pit, on which he explores the work of theater musicians. The Musician Toolkit podcast is a vehicle through which David shares the theme that musicianship is a passion and various topics related to musician development. We talk about his podcasts, as well as his personal discovery of music composition, collaboration, teaching, and podcasting. Additional themes of our conversation include his self-perception of being an accidental musician, his sometimes unorthodox career path, the value of supporting other musicians, and aligning core values with one's career pursuits. I wrote party in my notes. Career party pursuits, I think, is what I meant. You can find David's work at davidlanemusic.com. And yeah, we had a great conversation. He's a super nice guy. He was kind enough to feature me on his podcast for an upcoming episode, which I will share with you as soon as it comes available. But that'll be the Musician Toolkit with David Lane. Looking forward to that. Okay, without further ado... Please enjoy my conversation with David Lane. So you're a composer um, for film and other visual media, an arranger, an orchestrator, music teacher of something that caught my interest, theory and technology and more (laughs) in the teaching realm. And you're also a podcaster. That's a lot of stuff. Does that kind of capture most of your music world? Uh, Yeah, it's actually, you know, my my website is 
one of the things I need to do is to update it to kind of reflect because one of my missions for really the past 12 months has been to try to reduce a lot of that to call some of that my experience but not really advertising all of that because because just hearing you say that it's a bit confusing <laughs> yeah I understand but, and you know maybe I don't know if you're planning on still actually doing it all but just sort of narrowing the message down but I totally I totally get that. Where did you grow up, David? I grew up in the Panhandle, Florida. Uh, I think I just tell people next to Destin. That seems to be kind of popular enough. If if people say I don't know that what's well, close to Panama City or it's close to Pensacola, it's it's a part of Florida. If you look at a map of Florida uh, with Alabama and Georgia above it, I'm the part that's below Alabama. In fact, sometimes they call it LA for lower Alabama, but <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. The I, have, Coast, though. <laughs> I have a, um, at least one good friend of the podcast, uh, Dean Johannesson that plays a lot in Panama city. So I guess he's in your area. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's a really interesting, he has for some time, I don't know if he's, he's going to make it his life's work, but he's for, for some time now sort of focused on this genre we think he created called um circus swing <laughs> because of a, nice. a fascination oh with now to clarify history. i i grew up there i uh i grew up in florida i did i live in north carolina now i'm actually i live in winston-salem north carolina and so i've been here since 97 when i moved here for uh for grad school the, at the university of north carolina school of the arts and just never went away but yeah my roots are from florida that's funny uh I knew that you didn't live there because I was reading about your education. Well, I assumed that you may not live there, but I just like suddenly made the jump. So anyway, you scratch that, but <laughs> no, it's when, fun. <laughs> when, when did your interest in music begin? How did it begin? I guess, you know, it kind of predates my memory because, um, I have four older siblings. Like it's, it's kind of funny from I'm, I'm sibling number five or I'm child number five children, one through four of my parents, are all within less than six years of being the same age. And then between number four and myself is a 13 year gap. <laughs> so I'm, I mean, my, my brothers were in, and my sister was mostly like having, you know, like cousins or, you know, an uncle, <laughs> uncles and aunt, you know, more than a brother and sister relationship, just because we, you know, we were really literally different generations. I'm generation X and I had, you know, baby boomers for <laughs> siblings. But um, one of my older brothers, he was 15 years older. He was, um, he had gotten into piano when he was 13. And, um, you know, he had been taking for two years when I was born and he was really into classical music and he loved to practice. He would practice uh, you know, I've been told by my mom that uh, he would practice four hours a day, which is so funny because I hated to practice <laughs> when I mm -hmm. when I started taking lessons myself. But um, I he was the one sibling who was not old enough to have already moved away, you know, to actually be in the house when I was growing up and walking around. But at the same time, he he also took an interest and you know and uh you know would let me hang out with him and i would sit next to him sometimes on his lap while he's playing you know like working on some scales or something like that and he would just show me the names of the keys and and you know just without me being aware of it you know just kind of like i guess a child growing up in a you know a multilingual household i just picked up like i don't remember learning you know not knowing the keys on the piano and then learning them and uh, you know, along with that, because I was studying so young, you know, I, I developed, you know, what I tell everybody is called extended tonal memory. You know, some people call it perfect pitch. <laughs> I don't like calling it that because it's not perfect. You know, it's like if I'm not sick or if I'm sick or feeling tired, you know, that uh, it, it doesn't always come out perfectly. So I don't like to call it that. But um, I, I just started picking out some tunes by ear, like, uh, you know, my family went to church a lot and I would hear some hymn tunes and I would figure out the melody. And when I was old enough that a piano teacher would accept me into their studio, which I think I had to be, um, I had to complete kindergarten. I, I don't think they wanted me in there. I was small for my age, so they wanted me to get to a certain size. So I started just before I turned six taking lessons. And, uh, you know, I was just a reluctant musician. 
uh, one of the things that I had to think back on my life later, why I was so reluctant, reluctant to do it at first was that I really didn't understand how to practice music. I was just told to go practice and, you know, without any real specific guidance on that, it was, it was hard to improve. It's actually kind of a miracle that I did improve, <laughs> but it wasn't until I started writing down these improvisations I was doing, which I realized then made me a composer to realize that I had something I was passionate about and I was able to develop enough, um, to want to major in music and to become a composition major. And my, my goal was to become a, a film composer, but you know, not just any film composer. I wanted to be like the next John Williams. And, um, you know, I was, I was dreaming big, but that, that got me to, uh, to college. And that's, that's when I really truly started to enjoy music. Cause I guess it's a funny thing for someone to say, but, <clears throat> who who decided in advance to become a music major, but that was just because I didn't know what else to do. But uh, yeah, it's just, it's through composing that, that I got to college and, you know, I was fortunate to, as an undergrad to go to uh, Jacksonville university, which was a small program, but with some very talented, very accomplished professors. And they just encouraged you to do everything. It's like I could compose for any ensemble I wanted um, I got to, for scholarship reasons, I got to accompany vocal lessons and instrumental lessons. I uh, got to play in the wind ensemble and uh, orchestra on French horn. And I just experienced a, a, a variety of music. And that was then when I just realized, you know what I really love? Being around musicians, making music, collaborating. And, um, you know, that was the kind of the first step of many into to getting where I am today and just realizing what I really want to do is help other musicians become experience that well-rounded, that versatility. I love that. Do you find that trajectory that you just described somewhat unusual among like your peers or people you went to school with or people that you work with as far as being a teacher? Uh, yeah. Uh, especially considering that, you know, I would tell people several things. Um, uh, I was very sure of myself when I was, uh, you know, 19, 20 years old, but I, I'm sure like a lot of guys that age, you know, I'm not alone there in, in how certain I am, how my life is going to turn out. But, um, you know, I said, one of the things I absolutely did not plan to do was become a teacher. And when I graduated from North Carolina School of the Arts and, you know, had that moment where I'm done with my education to this point, what do I do next? I was working uh, retail in a local music store that sold pianos and uh, they taught they had teachers there teaching lessons and the piano teacher moved away and um, you know people still kept coming in to inquire about lessons and the manager asked me if um, if I would consider trying to teach a couple of lessons to see if I could you know kind of take off some of this uh flow of incoming students, you know, to kind of relieve that flow. And I, I said, okay, I'll, I'll give it a try, but you know, no promises, but it really only took a, a lesson or two because part of, part of why I didn't want to do it was the doubt that I could actually teach somebody. I mean, I didn't think that I could do that. And I definitely didn't think I'd have the patience to work with someone who didn't know what I did already. <laughs> But it's funny, you don't always know what you can do until you try and what you don't, and therefore you don't know what you might enjoy until you try it. But it only took one lesson before I knew that, actually, I think I can do this and I think I might like it. And I tried a few more lessons and I realized, well, this, this is something viable. It's a, it's a way to pass on what I know. You know, I, I wasn't sure how long I was going to do it, but you know, 20, three and a half years later, I'm still doing it. So <laughs> it, it must, it must be something that I, that I still truly love. And I keep finding out things I like about being a teacher that the, the types of things I like to share that has made me maybe a little bit more unorthodox in, in terms of the, the way that I like to teach. I'm very passionate about theory. i very passionate about 
music history. Basically, I'm the type of teacher I want my students to ask me off topic things, you know, you know, not just about the piano, but ask me other things so that we can explore other areas of music. It's like those are those are actually my favorite students that, <laughs> that want to, you know, peek around the rest of the musical world and see what's going on. But to kind of answer, you, you know, I think a little bit more directly your question. I, th I think my path was orthodox for being a, a composition major, but maybe where it led from there was maybe not so orthodox. I wasn't, uh, I, I didn't make it through college with a single minded purpose that I just wanted to do this one thing musically. And, uh, and I wanted to do that one thing better than everybody else. I think I went into college with that mindset, but then I came out of it with um, you know, how many different types of musical experiences can I just pick up and enjoy? And, you know, I still thought that one day film composing was ultimately how it was all going to turn out. And I got to experience that along the way. But, you know, it, it wasn't where life ultimately led. That's interesting. And I was thinking of the earliest part of how you, uh, your taste and and enjoyment of music and your skill sets developed, but it's it's super interesting to hear how it seemed maybe a little uh, orthodox in the beginning and not so much uh, in the latter part of of the education uh, right. chapters of it. But that's pretty cool. Yeah. So I listened to episode twelve, I think it was, and I mentioned it to you when I first reached out of of your musician toolkit podcast. And by the way, I only realized today that you have this other podcast life in the pit and i know you don't want to talk about the gazillion things you do today but but I, um <laughs> so so and it looks interesting too but anyway um i was looking okay so it's a new podcast to me and I, i'm like this looks kind of interesting so you talked about learning the apps of the trade which i thought was really cool <laughs> it's funny as i'm reading this and was yeah. looking at my notes today i was like you know i really haven't thought about that a lot since I heard it. And, um, I use a, a couple of, I'm thinking of a couple of apps, I actually probably use several, but I thought yeah, I should explore them more, which was one of the tips I remember. And then also the other thing, uh, advice that you had was on recognizing other musicians. And I don't recall because I listened to the episode a while back, like exactly how you tied them in. And then lastly, I, I believe you'd also said something about still being a work in progress yourself. And I, um, I'm kind of like trying to remember, was he, was he, was he referring to this whole, like checking out all the apps or was he just talking about himself as, um, a, a, a continually growing musician? But can you talk about, um, any three of those and what they have maybe meant to you as a musician, what they mean to you and or your students? Right. I, I can't remember specifically which episode that was. I know there there was also an episode that I did was 30 things that I would uh, tell myself 30 years ago because it was like acknowledging that it had been 30 years since I graduated high school. Uh, but I know I occasionally I've had some kind of general musicianship episodes to talk about things like calling out other musicians in a positive way. You know, I it's funny, I have a thread going on facebook at the moment that's uh i guess it's a spoiler for a future episode or it might be a past episode depending on when this interview comes out but i decided to explore the other side of things like what are what are some negative traits that you see in other musicians you know that you're like it makes you think you're surprised that anybody hires them but they're outliers you know it's like somehow maybe they have other qualities that allow them to get away with being not very likable or you know, not always showing up on time or something, you know, maybe they have something like that. Anyways, I wanted to put a list of that together for a solo episode at some point. But I'm thinking, you know, these are the types of things that if you want to be a professional musician and you want to be the type of person who comes to mind, you don't want to be doing things that are negative like that. So one of the things that you can do is to have the confidence in yourself to call out other musicians. Like if you go to a concert and, you know, you, you hear a good performance and, and, and of course, I mean, it's easy to go to, you know, a concert, like I went to see Muse back in March, you know, it's easy for me to go on Instagram and say what a great band they are. You know, they're, 
uh, in terms of monetary success are light years ahead of me. <laughs> mm -hmm. and they live on another continent. There's no self-esteem to, to worry about there for me to do that. But, uh, you know, if I go to the local college and someone who else who's, is playing the piano, which is my instrument, and I think they do a, you know, they're, they did a great concert. It's worth for me to hop on Twitter or Facebook or wherever and just to, you know, tag that person if I can and just say, you know, wonderful program, great job. You should go check him out sometime. So for one thing, it lifts up another musician, a colleague, because we are a community. You know, it's like, I think we really hurt ourselves when we try to think of ourselves as competitors. First of all, <laughs> people can only go to one concert at a time you know it's like they're not going to be at my concert and and his concert they're not going to be at multiple performances but people aren't you know aren't going to not come see me because they also go see this other guy and what i also do is i i let other musicians know that i'm supportive of them but i also tell you know just anybody who sees me that that i'm not so stuck on you know, the, the fragile self ego of having to only talk about myself that I can't possibly be supportive of other musicians. And I, I really think that that speaks volumes, you know, to people who maybe want to collaborate with you. They want to collaborate with somebody who's positive, you know, the, and then of course the other things, yeah, learning apps. Yeah. I am a work in progress on that. I, I have made a point of like getting better with Logic Pro, for example, that that was something that I I'd been putting off for a while. And I I finally went to YouTube. A guy had a video series. I think it's like 65 videos and, and counting <laughs> of Logic Pro. And I just watched all of them. And I even opened up a file and took some notes. And uh, and I heard I heard another pod, uh, another guest on another podcast talk about Finale one time. And just saying, you know, what she would recommend if you want to, if you really want to master the use of that app is you just start, you go to the top where you have all the windows, go to the one on the left and just click everything. <laughs> if, it, if it brings you to like a, a subfolder of other options, go through everything and, you know, just see what it does. And then if it does something and it changes what's going on, just click that undo button or close the file and don't save it. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's like you, you don't have to worry about like anything catastrophic, but you want to know before you ever need it, what does this program do? Because one of the things that kills your workflow is when you have to stop to figure out how to do something, or even if the program can do it. And that's happened to me a lot over the years when I'm in finale or logic or something. It's like, I know what I need to do this particular notation or I need to record this type of an effect but how do i do it that's the tough part so the more you can spend time like learning the the tools that you have the better and it's the same thing why why do musicians practice scale so much you know it's so that they when they're playing music that is scale like they're not having to figure out how to do this technique they just realize oh, i already have this technique i play i just need to modify it to fit this music right yeah. I share the experience of how wonderful it is to watch, be part of uh, other musicians, you know, whether they're <laughs> they're throwing some compliment at me or someone else and or just being like supportive of the ensemble they happen to be working with, how much that that lifts people up. And and at the same time, you know, I, I definitely have seen players sometimes that are just so talented that they get by with <laughs> <laughs> they get by with a lot until they don't. Um, but yeah, I, well, you know, just to kind of add to that, I, I mean, I, or, or kind of reinforce this one idea. I think a lot of things that people do, like uh, I was talking to my wife about some of these things that were coming in on this on this ongoing thread that I have of the negative things that musicians do. And almost all of them lead to one thing and that's insecurity. It's like when you're not sure that you're good enough to just go do the job, you you do things that draw attention to yourself and you you feel unwilling to draw attention away from yourself. And so I think when you when you reach a point to where you're confident in yourself and 
your ability to to do your job well as a musician you then allow yourself the freedom to to be able to s- support others and i think that comes off subliminally you know when you're able to call out somebody else in a positive way and not just in a negative way to, because because you know calling out someone in a negative way is another way to draw attention to yourself you know look how great i am by comparison but when you call out somebody in a positive way you are you're telling them i'm confident in myself i don't need to satisfy my ego by taking away from the great work that this other colleague is doing yeah that's so true so true and it, and maybe something i've overlooked but uh you know i've gotten caught up and maybe you have too caught up in the whole insecurity game <laughs> and comparing yourself to to others which is a dangerous one to play but yeah when i look at others who you know, perhaps could be better overall just because like they may be really talented or marginally so but but uh, they could be even better with certain little tweaks in their uh, I suppose mannerisms <laughs> around other musicians and how they oh, sort yeah. of treat the community. Well, let's let's kind of wrap up with something that you had mentioned to me in some of our written correspondence that I, I thought would be interesting to listeners of The Unstarving Musician, and that is uh, choosing a career as defining your core values and, and being open to opportunities that fit that set of values and kind of, I guess, how that fit into your uh, journey and in, in the various things that you've uh, been able to do as a musician. Yeah, of course. You know, as, so as I mentioned, and you know, I need to update my website accordingly. I, for a very long time, wanted to be a film composer, and you know, my my website still says my website still says that I am, but it is only about a year or two ago, maybe like a year and a half ago. That I finally had the courage to tell to tell myself that I might accept a film scoring gig if it came along, if I had the time, if it was something that was a project of interest. You know, if the opportunity fell in my lap, I wouldn't say no. But I don't call myself a film composer anymore. It's not something that I do. And the steps that led me to that, for years, I was not doing the work to become a film composer. So, so like, you know, I'm living on the East Coast. I never moved to L.A. You know, I never did the type of networking. I never, you know, saved up again to move to L.A. or somewhere where I could really learn to meet the people that I needed to do and to do the projects that would lead to bigger projects. I kind of was just accepting of these smaller short films and, you know, occasionally an independent feature that would come my way and i you know i just i kept saying i want to be a film composer i want to be a film composer but i wasn't willing you know to to do the work to lead to that so i finally decided on the advice of a coach to ask myself why i want to be a film composer and i came up with two answers for that and the first one was not very flattering, you know, and I realized that that I I need to just kind of discard this as uh, a worthy reason. And that was I wanted to be uh, lauded. I wanted to picture myself on the podium, you know, at the Oscar ceremony, accepting the award for for best original sc- score and giving my Oscar speech and the people <laughs> talking to me about, you know, about me as this next great film composer. And you know, uh, not to discourage anybody from wanting to be recognized. I I think that has to be almost an accidental result of doing your job well and pursuing in some, you know, pursuing other values in your career. So as soon as I said, well, that's not really good enough reason to be a film composer, I asked myself, what other things do I like about it? And what I really loved was collaborating with other artists and and especially people who aren't necessarily always musicians. And then I thought about it. Well, I've had some success in musical theater and that is working with actors and, uh, you know, and people who 
don't always, um, they're not always musicians. I also have had uh, been able to, as an arranger to work with like songwriters who, you know, they have the song idea, but they, they don't know how to express it notationally. And they know they want this big piano part, but they're not able to play it. They don't know how to create it and they want drums with it, but they don't know how to write that. So that's, that's something that I can provide. Um, sometimes a play will want some music uh, to go along with a scene. It's not necessarily a musical. They just want some instrumental transition tracks. There are so many ways that I can use my skills that I've learned in film scoring to work with others. And one of those ways is also teaching. I'm working with people who are learning how to become musicians and I'm collaborating with them and I'm sharing what it is I know. So it's like all these things are the same as film scoring. So when I wanted to be a film composer, that was the wrong goal. My goal should be, I want to excel at being uh, collaborative with other non-musicians and musicians alike. And then I would have had several doors, several opportunities that I could pursue and, you know, wait for, for the right opportunity to come along that I could put more energy in and develop instead of kind of ignoring the fact that film scoring was obviously not it because if it was, I, I would be living my life in such a way that led to that result. But I noticed that I was not turning off, the, you know, that energy toward other areas. So this is just something that I just always now challenge musicians at any stage of their career. If they don't have a hundred percent passion for what they're doing, you know, try to strip down why it is that you're doing this in the first place and find the reason that you say that's a worthy reason that's a worthy goal and and then put that as your goal and then find the opportunities that fit that goal and then you'll you'll have you'll then you'll start to see what the opportunities really are that's such beautiful advice and uh i th i get think i've learned that starting with asking that whole why question is uh there's a lot of, there's been a lot of value for me in asking it repeatedly you know on a recurring basis because sometimes it changes a little bit and sometimes it's hard to really refine but yeah beautiful advice and it's uh clearly helping you along the journey that that you are able a journey that you're able to make the most of so really cool I know that davidlanemusic.com is a little, maybe talks about a little more than you want it to at the moment, but it looks like a fantastic place for people to find out about work that you've done, work that you're doing, the podcast, podcasts, and um, all your socials are on there. Is there any anything else that people who want to learn more about you should do besides check out davidlanemusic.com? You know, if anybody has any questions, uh, they can go check that out. And also, yeah, my podcasts are the musician toolkit, which is my new one. It's where my passion is, is where I talk about the things about, uh, that a well-rounded musician can do. And, and my other podcast we didn't mention, it's just, if you are a fan of musical theater and, um, uh, you want to just hear about the lives of people that play in the pit that play, you know, the instrumental music while a musical's going on, that's called life in the pit. And, it's not very active right now, but there are a lot of great episodes in the past. If anyone wants to just check out that, uh, I have several Broadway musicians that have been on there before. Amazing. Yeah. I, I, I was looking at life in the pit today and it looks very interesting, especially for someone like me with my background and, and the musician toolkit has a, a great range of, of topics there. So I encourage everyone to check that out. Thanks so much for joining for the, joining me today for this conversation. It was great. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure. This episode was powered by Podcast Startup. If you feel you need a little help with that podcast you're contemplating, Podcast Startup may be just the thing for you. Podcast Startup is a program designed for new podcasters. Did you know that most podcasts don't make it past their first few episodes? That's right. They start 
they stall, and then they die. Sustaining a podcast ain't easy. It's commitment. A lack of planning and misaligned expectations are a recipe for fast burnout and fade out for podcasters. This is exactly the kind of thing that Podcast Startup was designed to help you with. If you're intrigued, if you want to start a podcast the right way, go to unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast startup to learn more and to receive free podcast startup tips from yours truly. Thank you for listening. You can leave us feedback, questions, comments, complaints at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash feedback. If you enjoyed this podcast, please follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. If you love this podcast, please visit unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor to learn about the many ways of showing your love and support. Your support does indeed equal love. The series music you heard in this episode is New Gods Part 2 by Yours Truly. Find links for all the places to hear the full version with vocals by Yours Truly at robonzo.com. If you do not yet have a website for your music, check out Bandzoogle. It was created to help musicians and bands build their website and manage direct-to-fan marketing and sales. Bandzoogle has amazing design options, a commission-free store to sell music, merch, tickets, and more, plus tools that can capture detailed fan data for you. Try it at bandzoogle.com. Use the promo code ROBONZO, that's R-O-B-O-N-Z-O, to get 15% off your first year. Find links for all the people and things talked about in this episode at unstarvingmusician.com. Peace, love, and a whole lot of gratitude.